Now let's pray. Our Father, we ask that your spirit will help us this morning, help us to hear and understand your word better. We pray that you might speak to us, give us better understanding, lead us into ministries that we've only begun in or not even thought of maybe today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Second sermon by request, like may not be what was requested. And I should apologise for last week to the people with kids. Well, it was a bit long last week, so I'll try to make it short this week. Uh, last week also I referred to a whole lot of things that had been invented and, uh, and uh, thought up as a result of lots of human traditions that had nothing to do with the scriptures. And the same applies today. We're talking about what should Christians do in the world to do with things that might be roughly called social justice. Should Christians get involved in politics, become part of political parties? Should Christians be involved in lobbying or agitating or uh, be active refugees, for example, or fracking, or other things to do with environmental damage, plastics in the ocean, indigenous disadvantage, gender equality, same-sex marriage, slavery, exploitative labour practices, government and business? Should Christians get involved in any of that? Some people would say, obviously, yes. Others would say, definitely not. And others would say, well, it depends. Probably got a lot of depends here, have we? We'll see. One of the dangers, of course, is that getting involved in any of that stuff might f result in us working for the world. I got a brochure this week in the mail Lenten studies produced by a church somewhere else in Australia and part of the appeal of this set of Lenten studies was that would help us to work out where society has gone wrong and in particular why is the church seen as irrelevant and so uh, the purpose of these studies one of the purposes is to find ways that we can be seen as relevant in the world while not losing our Christian authenticity do we need to be relevant? Is that one of the things we want to do to get involved in this? Some of you will know the unofficial English anthem uh, written by William Blake. And did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's mountains green and was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? You know the song. I think it was, at least if you watch the last night of the proms, you'll hear it sung every year. Is that right? Some of you know this? Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> It finishes, I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green. Now William Blake, writing in 1810, 30 years after the, 20 years after the French Revolution, after the Napoleonic Wars, did he really think that the answer to his questions was yes? I think he probably thought the answer was no. Not only did the feet never work in England, but whether they had any chance of building Jerusalem in England's green and sunny land, uh, they probably had Buckley's. Well, that's for the poets and the historians to debate, I suppose. But that's part of the issue for us. Do we want to build Jerusalem? Do we want to build a Christian society? Do we want to get involved in this stuff for that kind of reason? Now, one of the other difficulties, of course, is that we live at the moment in a society that's got so much media coverage that there's huge amounts of social pressure, uh, popular opinions, opinion polls about almost every, anything, quite aggressive activism, a lot of anger, a lot of self-righteousness from the people who speak out on whatever the topic might be, and a lot of bullying. So not only is the tone of the debate, debate changed, but uh, the, the way it's, the, the, the kind of background for it has changed as well. And one of the questions I think we ought to ask ourselves before we go too far down the path of getting involved in any of this stuff is, well, if I get involved in it, what is, what is the aim I'm pursuing? What, what am I trying to build? What, what am I contributing to? Who am I serving? Am I there to save society? Am I there to save the planet? Am I actually involved in some kind of social engineering disguised as justice or equity? The answer to that is yes, you will be. Am I involved in progress? Progress towards what? According to which worldview? 
And will you turn progress into an adjective and then a noun and become a progressive? Uh, according to what foundation and basis would you be doing that? Do we want to help build a better society? Yes, but on what basis? What kind of a society? We want to build a utopia. Of course, if you spell utopia without an E at the, bottom, at the beginning of the word, you're building what Thomas More said was nothing, a no place, nowhere. It's a nowhere. That's, that's part of the uh, difficulty. That a lot of the social activism and pressure and stuff that we see is a result of fear that arises from godlessness. People are afraid, they don't believe in God, they're quite anti-God, lots of them, and uh, they're trying really hard to do something about a world, in a sense, under God's judgment. Now, there are a couple of problems for Christians, of course. Once you get involved, you're, you're cooperating and working with people who may well have contrary ideologies. Clearly, socialism is on the rise, atheism, anarchism, cultural superiority, the cultural superiority now that looks down on the old missionary superiority is now a cultural superiority of a certain kind of modern, educated Western female. That seems to me to be, okay, I've, I've, I've classified myself by saying it, but that's part of the issue, isn't it? The, the superiority is in the people with the loud voices. And a, of course, one of the difficulties I think we Christians have is that a lot of the debate involves bullying, and uh, we naturally don't like that. But there's also a lot of self-righteousness involved in it, self-justifying. And uh, we ask ourselves, well, what kind of moral or ethical basis is behind the desire to do whatever the thing is? A lot of it is modern humanistic. Some of it is just self-interest. In the end, how do you decide whether what this person did was wrong or not? Well, I didn't like it. That's the, that's the criteria. It's a self-interest, humanistic. And, of course, one of the strong things at the moment is me as a persecuted victim. But, of course, could Christians do the same stuff, but from different motives and different reasons? So let's come to Christians who belong to the kingdom, the kingdom of God. On what basis might we get involved in any of these issues? Christian reasons and motives. Well, we might want to establish a Christian society. Some of us might want to go back to the mythological Christian society of the 1950s. Others, of course, don't want to get involved at all. We'll retreat. We want to have no action. The world is under judgment. Let's preach the gospel and leave, leave the others to sort out their mess. I want to suggest to you there are other ways of looking at this. We ought to see ourselves in the first place as citizens. Erastus. Erastus is mentioned at the end of Romans. He's, the, he's either the chief financial officer of Corinth or he's the director of public works of Corinth. It depends which translation you read. But he's obviously a senior public servant in Corinth. And there are lots of Christians who are public servants, senior and down the rungs and wherever else. Presumably Erastus and all the others ought to be operating within their job description with Christian ethics and Christian principles. Jesus himself, when asked about paying taxes, said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. We've got responsibilities to the society and the state that we're part of, so we ought to do it well. Or to take the famous statement back in Jeremiah 21 that was told to the exiles in Babylon, pray and work for the good of the city that you're in, because then that, that will be to your good. And that seems to me still a good idea, is it not? That we should pray and work for the welfare of the place where we live, not retreat and give up. We're citizens, so we ought to act as Christian citizens. But we're also stewards. And particularly in the environmental world, we don't need to go to some kind of eco-theology. We just need to go back to Genesis, don't we not? Where, where the humans were told to look after the creation, to tender it, look after it. Well, look after it. Nothing has changed about our responsibility to be stewards in the creation. And I think for some of us, if we could get away from the propaganda outside from the secular environmentalists and read some stuff that Christians are writing, we might be able to contribute something really good there. Well, lots of people are contributing something good already. But we're also disciples. Disciples who've received mercy 
who've been shown compassion. We read in Deuteronomy, and this is uh, repeated quite a few times in those books, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Numbers. You were, you were foreigners. You were strangers in Egypt, and the Lord brought you out. So now you've got to love the strangers and the foreigners and the refugees who live among you now. It's very clear, and it's repeated more than once in the Old Testament times. You used to be like that. Now, lots of us weren't, in that sense, refugees. But we are strangers. We are foreigners because this world we live in is not our, is, this is not our home country. We're waiting, like Abraham, for a city whose foundations are eternal, whose builder and maker is God. We are sojourners and strangers and in transit here. We're expatriates, if you like. And so we ought to look with eyes of all the others who, in human terms, are expatriates and foreigners and refugees and strangers. Because God has shown mercy to us. God has given us mercy. We ought to show mercy. As for our enemies, we ought to act like God. So Romans 12, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, God makes his rain shine on the just and the unjust alike. So what do you do with your enemies? Well, he says, love them and feed them. That's Romans 12. Love and feed and pray for your enemies. Do good to them. And, uh, well, I don't need to underline it, but I'll mention it. Uh, widows and orphans, they get mentioned all the way through the Bible, right through to James. Look after the orphans and the, orphans and the widows. Now, underneath all of this is what I was saying to the children. This is compassion. This is God's compassion and love to us, which we share and give to other people. But in order to have compassion, you have to have knowledge. And so the thing, big thing in the news this weekend regarding compassion has been a Kubra dolly, little dolly Everett, who took a life this last week from being bullied, apparently. Now, lots of us know people who are being bullied. Young people know who are being bullied. Uh, is there something that Christians can do about that? It seems to be, in a sense, bullying was always, on the, on, always there, wasn't it? I remember when I was about... I don't know, 10. Bullying had to do with being punched up in the playground. But bullying is much more uh, sophisticated than that now. It might include that. But to know about it is one thing. To have compassion is another. But you can't have the compassion unless you know. School, work. And as I said at the beginning of this little talk, just in our social debates, there's so much bullying, so much violence, so much aggression, is there not? This is, this is a, in a sense, a not, a not a surprising development in a society that has abandoned God. But it's there at all levels. And Christians obviously need to behave, it seems obvious to me, in a non-bullying way, in a kind and gentle way, in a humble way, uh, in a non-aggressive way, in a non-self-righteous way, with humility, but also to look out for the ones who are being bullied, who are being oppressed, are being, who are genuinely victims, and have compassion. We've been blessed in order to bless. 1 Timothy 6 talks about rich people. They shouldn't get too uppity. They shouldn't get proud and arrogant. What should they do with their money? They should be generous. They should share. They should look after the poor. It runs all the way through the Bible, doesn't it? The motives for Christians to get involved in this stuff is really crucial and separates us very clearly from a lot of what's going on in the, in the secular world. We want to be people who express the character of the Father. We want to be like the Father and love like the Father, to show his compassion and love, in 1 Corinthians 13, you know the famous 1 Corinthians 13, but it's, chap it's between chapters 12 and 14 of 1 Corinthians, isn't it? You all know that. And 12 and 14 is about all the gifts for using in the church. But why is he stuck th the stuff about love in the middle? Because love is the seedbed from which the ministries arise in the church. Love is the seedbed from which all the action happens. And we've got to start with the seedbed. We've got to start with the love and the compassion, which we know already from God himself. And from that, we're able to work out how to do whatever it is that God has called us to do. 
It's really easy in the modern world either to say it's all too difficult, so let someone else do it, or to say, yeah, I think we really should go and do something and punch someone in the head and get a new government or whatever it is you really feel enthusiastic about. And you might want to do, well, not punch them in the head, but you might want to do something really strong. But if it starts from compassion and love and the Father's heart, then in the end, the effect will be much better. Now, there are two qualifications in this big debate, and I said this was a very brief little talk. I hope it's still brief. One of the qualifications is that in this debate about and discussion about social justice and all the broad issues related to it, that Jesus and the scriptures tend to get hijacked. They get hijacked for secular projects. What Jesus said or did, a lot of it is made up because he never said or did a lot of the things that people say that he said or did, especially when it comes to the poor. But the thing is that most of the instructions in the Bible have to do with what you do towards God's people, not the outsiders already referred to the refugees and that, they're outsiders in this, in this sense. But a lot of it's had to do with God. So Matthew 25, Matthew 25 that we read for the gospel today about the sheep and the goats, it must be the most hijacked passage in the New Testament when it comes to this. Because it's applied really easily to anybody who's poor or hungry or naked or whatever. But it's really clear that this is a judgment of the nations as to how they've treated God's people. These my brothers, he makes it really clear, my brothers and sisters, the people who belong to Christ. So the people who are burning the churches in Cairo and the China and Indonesia and Nigeria and persecuting Christians, they will be the ones who are answering to, to Matthew 25. But we Christians also need to pay attention to it because in the end, although it appears that the judgment has to do with what people do, in the end, what they do is a mark of who they are and where they've come from and whether they're expressing the character and love of the Father. And Christians, although this applies to Christians looking after the poor Christians, the Christians will not want to limit it to that, will we? Because when, you're, when you have compassion, you don't say, well, you know, do you really go to church? Are you really a Christian? Otherwise, I'm not going to help you. You would never think of doing that. It, it spreads. 25 in the end doesn't tell us all of those things. That's one qualification. The other qualification is that we belong to the king and his kingdom is not of this world. He told Pilate that. Although we are still citizens of this world and of this society that we're part of. But our home is in the age to come. We, we live here, but this is not where we ultimately belong. And the king has come not to set right all the ills of society... He has come not to fix a new world, certainly not through us. He's going to recreate a new one altogether. He's come to bring people into fellowship with his Father. He's come to deal with the godlessness of a world that has pushed God out. That's the primary thing he's doing. But he has left his people here as salt and light to show his love and compassion just like he did when he was here. So ultimately... We want people to come as friends of God. We want people to know the Father. Yes, we might want to help the refugee. We certainly would want to help the poor and the widows, and the whatever, whether they're a Muslim or a Buddhist or an Australian pagan. But we want them to come and know the loving Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're citizens, stewards, as God's servants, some of us ought to put our mind to this, link up with other groups that are already doing something useful from a Christian perspective. I can give you leads on some if you want to know about them. But we need to be people who are disciples first and know the love and compassion of the Father. And as we hear all this stuff about thousands and thousands of difficulties in the world, just in our society in Perth, how is the compassion of the Father leading me to do anything about it? He may be, he may be not. Maybe helping you to cooperate. But it has to come from disciples who firstly are proclaiming the King and living the King's compassion and love and then see if the Lord is calling them to any of these things. Let's pray. Father, thank you. 
that in a godless world you've left your people as a light, that you've shown us mercy so we can show mercy. You've given us a gospel to bring people to know you. And we pray that there might be some here who will actually take some action to help some of these matters from a Christian point of view. And particularly for the refugees and the orphans and the widows and the oppressed and the real victims, the people who are bullied, that you will give us ways to show compassion and to bring help. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. stand as we declare our faith in <clears throat> do you believe I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth and his son Jesus Christ I believe in Jesus Christ 